Two weeks ago, you heard our conversation about seeding rates in corn with Kansas State University's Ignacio Ciampiti. This week, we'll show you a second half to that discussion, which includes questions about using nitrogen in soybeans and growing soybeans in back-to-back -back years, a practice common in his home country of Argentina. The idea of using nitrogen to boost soybean yields isn't new, and this won't be the first time we've covered it. As we've told you previously, UNL studies reveal the practice is generally not profitable. Ignacio presented research on the topic at the recent Nebraska Crop Management Conference, where we asked him to further explain his results. Based on our research, uh, we decided to, to take, this, take the approach in a different way. We decided to start looking at what are the situations that if we apply nitrogen, soybean might respond. And what we found out in our research is there are specific environmental situations where if you apply nitrogen, soybean could respond. But those situations are too specific. So just to give an example, many times farmers usually don't, I mean, in many situations, they, they don't inoculate. If they don't use any inoculant, and if we have any poor nodulation, or if we have any stress early in the growing season, when I'm talking about a stress situation, it could be flooding, early season, um, much precipitation, so that bacteria and plant doesn't recognize. Second factor, pH. If you have a very low pH, or if you have problems of nutrient deficiency, that deficiency could be impacting the association of the bacteria with the plant. Another third factor, temperature. If you are running into late planting soybeans, high temperature in soils, then you have also problems with that inoculation. So any situation that is promoting early season stress for the plant, it will probably jeopardize the connection between the plant and the bacteria. If that is the case, then you might find out around mid-August, you go back to your fields and you start looking at deficiency. And the question in your case is, what's going on? Why the rhizobia didn't work? Many times for answer that question, you need to go back to the early in the season to start thinking about what were the main factors affecting your no nodulation. So in that instance, I should apply nitrogen? In that instance, if you really are thinking that, and if you want to maintain your productivity, the only way to rescue that plant is with nitrogen. Economically speaking, the farmer needs to start looking at the, calcula and the cal calculations and looking how much nitrogen can you apply and how you can secure that in some way effectively apply that nitrogen because if you apply way too much, then you have the challenge of burning leaves and making more damage than benefit. So that nitrogen needs to go to the soil and you need to make sure that it's available for the plant. In our studies, when you go to any field conditions with not really much of issues on nodulation, I will say that in few situations, I will say 5% of the cases or even lower than that, we are seeing responses to nitrogen. Still, it's an interesting topic. I think that the way that we need to approach this topic is not by applying nitrogen and trying to see if we can get a response. I think that the, the approach that we, we took in the last probably 20, 30 years is, is the wrong one. The way that we need to approach this topic is, let's start to look at what are the main factors that might affect the, the fixation, and let's start finding in some way how we can screen the environments and make sure that we can provide to the farmers indicators of potential probability to the response. You're from Argentina where farmers grow soybeans consistently, year after year after year. This year there might be some interest in doing that. What do you notice when you grow soybeans consistently? One of the main factors, I mean, when you're looking at monocrop, when you're looking at several years on soybeans, is that soybean is a crop that demands a lot of nutrients. When you're looking at, we discussed recently about nitrogen, another factor that sometimes we tend to discuss too much is on sulfur. Uh, soybeans are highly extractive on nitrogen and sulfur, and primarily because it's a high protein. It's a high protein, high rich in amino acids. So, so the quality is basically what is pushing to this plant to keep that uptake. One of the challenges when you look at these systems is many times in our situation, in our case in Argentina, many of our farmers, they didn't treat the soybeans, I mean, in, in the way that they need to treat applying nutrients and they avoid nutrient applications. So when you look at long-term soybean monocrop, uh, in many of our situations, we start seeing problems with sulfur deficiency. And that sulfur deficiency, believe it, believe it or not, in many cases, you might be able to solve that with 10 pounds of sulfur. And you can see a yield penalty from that. And then the second factor is on the yield penalty. When you look at 
diversity, the lack of diversity on that rotation, monocrop, is basically you start increasing the pressure of insects, disease, and then if you add, add to the combo of the problem of nutrient deficiency, uh, one of the things that we capture in many of our long-term st studies of looking at monocrop soybeans is penalties that they go from two or four bushels any time that you grow a consecutive years of soybeans. So if you are starting with a yield, even if you are in a high yielding environment and you start with 70, 80 bushels, you might start seeing that your second year, your yield potential might be less at 65, and then you are keeping going in that direction and the question is, at what point will, will, will plateau? And then that's, that's something that we don't really want to answer. Mm -hmm.